good flick, good flick. No, you're not close enough who I am. That's okay. Uh, my name is Dee Lauderdale. I'm a part of the Madison campus. My wife and I attend there. Um, married, have two kids, two girls, 24 and 18. And I work for a defense contractor here in town as a business manager. And uh, before that, for about 11 years, I did church work. I was executive pastor of a couple of churches. And then for about almost five years, I had a temporary bout of insanity and planted a church. If you ever get a chance to do that, you might want to pass. Really excited to be here. When Michael and Suzanne asked me to speak and told me what the uh, series was going to be, and they assigned me the movie, I was excited. If you haven't seen it, really encourage you to see it. Uh, my wife and I went to see it on a date night, and when we came out, I told her, I said, you know, the thing about this movie is it's not trying to figure out one sermon. It's figuring out which one of about 10 or 12 that I've written out of this. The basis of the movie is you saw uh, John Hamm, the character, that you might know from Mad Men, is a sports agent who's about to go bankrupt. And so to save his agency, he just comes up with this idea to do a, an American Idol-like competition to find a baseball pitcher in India. And I won't spoil the rest of the movie for you, but it's highly recommended. The problem is J.B. Bernstein, based on a true story, um, is a jerk. He's not a nice guy in the movie because he doesn't understand the power that can happen when an older guy expresses some belief and confidence in a younger guy. But I want you to remember kind of the end of the, of the flick of the trailer there when he says, you could never let me down. And that's something that's going to be really important as we work our way through today. And it's something that makes um, a lot of sense to me because back in the dark ages, I decided that it was time to get married. And that meant you had to buy a ring. And if you grew up in Athens, Alabama like I did, that meant that you had to go visit Cluxton's Jewelry Store right on the square. Cluxton's was owned by a, name, a man named Jimmy Harris that I had literally known all my life. In fact, I had graduated from high school with his daughter. And so I go see Jimmy, and we, he helps me pick a ring, pick the stone. We even pick the setting that he's going to make for me, and we negotiate a price, and everything's great. And I said, but Jimmy, i got a problem. The money that I have to pay you for this ring is tied up in a CD, and the CD is not going to mature until a couple of months after I wanted to give Susan the ring. Jimmy said, D, not a problem. Just bring me the money when you get it. All he asked me to do was sign a credit card receipt. Fast forward a couple of weeks, phone rings, and it's Cluxton's telling me my ring is ready. And so I get my mom and dad to meet me there so they can see the ring, give their approval, la da 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 So we sit down. They're, they're loving it. And we get through, and we're about to leave, and that's when it happens. My dad, being the good southern dad that he is, looks at Jimmy and said, Hey, Jimmy, do I need to sign anything because of this deal you and Dee have got worked out? And that's when it happens. I can take you to the exact spot where it happened today. And Jimmy looked at my dad and said, Nope, this is between me and him. I was 19 years old. And I wish I had the vocabulary to describe the feeling that I had that day, where an older guy had expressed confidence in me. He trusted me. He said, yeah, we're good. Well, we're going to read a story today in Matthew chapter 4. And if you've got a Bible, I invite you to open there or your app, or I'll have the verses up on the screen about a story that happened when Jesus had a similar interaction with a couple of teenage brothers. And that interaction really has a great deal to do with the fact that all of us are still sitting here in this room today. But to help you, I really want these verses to have the same impact on you that they had on those teenagers. So you've got to bear with me for just a couple of minutes, and I've got to, I got to take you deep, deep, deep into the first century world of Jesus and try to create the atmosphere in which this was said. And to begin with, you've got to know that the, the biggest goal uh, that every Jewish parent had, that at least one of their sons would become a rabbi. And the reason was, rabbi was the ultimate job. A rabbi was part preacher, he was part professor, he was part lawyer, he was part stand-up comic. Rabbis were sarcastic. Rabbis were brilliant. They were argumentative. They were just hilarious. They were the rock stars of the day. 
and you wanted at least one of your sons to become a rabbi. But to get there, he's going to have to navigate the Jewish educational system of the first century. And he's got to work his way up there. And the first thing he's going to go through is a thing called Bet Sefer. Now, Bet Sefer was from age 6 to age 10. So at age 6, every Jewish mom and dad would take their son and daughter and walk them down to the local Torah teacher to begin Bet Sefer. And from age 6 to age 10, they had but one goal. That was to memorize the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Memorize the Torah. Memorize Genesis. Memorize Exodus. Memorize Leviticus. Have you read Leviticus lately? Go home and read a couple of chapters and see how well you think you do memorizing it. And the reason they were memorizing the Torah was because the Torah was central to that life. It was your muchness. Your goal was to learn and live Torah. And you had to memorize it because, remember, I've got you know, a hard copy of the Scriptures, and I don't know how many translations and copies of the Scriptures I have on my iPad. But in the first century, one community might have one copy of the Scriptures. And so if you were going to live it, you had to know it. And if you didn't have a copy of it, your only option was to memorize it. Well, the first time I learned this, I thought, man, they must have just had massive super retention in the first century, right? And then it dawned on me. I can recite almost any episode of Mash. Right? My, my family won't even watch it with me anymore because I say the lines before the actor does. So I thought, okay, it's not a question of ability. It's just what we choose to focus on whole nother sermon that I'll do one day. So from age 6 to age 10, they're a part of Bet Sefer. At age 10, all the girls went home to learn how to be moms, wives, but the best of the best, and here's the part I need you to grab on to, the best of the best got to move on, the boys. The other boys went home to learn how to be a family business, fisherman, farmer, uh, carpenter, whatever. They went home to learn how to do that. But the best of the best moved on to the next level, which was called Bet Midrash. Now, in Bet Midrash, from age 10 to age 15, you memorize the rest of the Old Testament, including those books that you can't pronounce. Memorize them. Again, when I first learned this, I thought, that couldn't happen today. But the guy that I learned this from is a guy named Ray Vanderlaan, and Ray uh, teaches at a Christian school in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. He went to a yeshiva, which is a Jewish seminary in the mid-80s, and said he was the only student who did not have the entire Old Testament memorized in Hebrew and English. So again, it's not a question of ability. It's just what we choose to focus on. But they also did something else in Bet Midrash. They began to learn to work with the scriptures, to interpret them, to move with them, to debate them, to discuss them. And they did that using the Jewish system of question and answer. And you see this in the scriptures. If you remember the story, when Jesus and his parents had gone to the Passover and they were traveling back and they missed him. And so they spent three days looking for him. And they finally found him. And this is in Luke chapter 2. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. A really fun experiment is to go through the Gospels and read every time Jesus answered a question with another question. It's part of the process, and it still goes on today. A few years ago, a lady was visiting a photography shop in the old city of Jerusalem and was amazed at the quality of the photographs. And she asked the shopkeeper, the photographer, which one is your favorite? And he looked at her, and his response was, are you married? She's like, yeah. He said, do you have children? She's thinking, I tell you my whole life story. I just want to know which your favorite picture is. So she finally kind of exasperated said, yeah, I have kids. And he said, which one's your favorite? She got her answer in a way that was much deeper than if she had just said, if he had just said, oh, they're all my favorite or I don't have a favorite. That's this process of question and answer that the boys were going through. And then at age 15, the best of the best, right, the very best of the best, then 
you get to move on to the last lesson, the last issue, the last stage called Bet Talmud. Now, in Bet Talmud, things change radically. You begin, you, you make the transition from working with a Torah teacher to now you're going to find you're going to find a rabbi to follow. Because remember, the goal is to become a rabbi because being a rabbi is the best of the best of the best. And so in Bet Talmud, these boys, these teenagers, start going around listening to rabbis because there were hundreds of these rabbis traveling all over the Palestine in the first century. And you're trying to find out which one you want to follow. And you do it because every rabbi had his own yoke, which was his interpretation of Scripture, his way of living. And so you would begin following one until you, and listening until you found one that you said, that's my guy. That's who I want to be. Because the goal was not just to know what the rabbi knew. You wanted to be able to do what the rabbi did. And so once you found him, your goal was that hopefully he would take you on as his Talmud. Talmud is Hebrew for disciple. And so you would sit down in front of this rabbi, and that was your way of saying, Rabbi, I want to be your disciple. I want to be your Talmud. And the rabbi would be totally, totally uh, blown away that you would want to do that. But the rabbi had a problem. He believed his way, his yoke of interpreting Scripture was the most life-giving way of living. And so, therefore, he wanted as many people as possible to know it. And he could only talk to so many, so he was finding his Talmud Guys who could do what he did and knew what he did to go teach his yoke. And so he would begin an examination process. And this is a natural question. The rabbi would look at a potential Talmud and say, in the book of Deuteronomy, there are 17 references to the book of Hosea. In the book of Hosea, there are 17 references to the book of Deuteronomy. Give them to me, every other one backwards. Most of the kids curled up in a fetal position and started crying. But occasionally, there would be a kid who had one. He could do it. And the rabbi would look at him and he would say, Let Akarai, which means follow me. He was saying to the kid, I believe that you can do what I do. I believe you can be what I am. This was the equivalent of Nick Saban taking a 16-year-old kid and saying, You're going to be my successor. I'm going to teach you all of my secrets. This is the equivalent of LeBron James taking a kid off a of basketball court in the inner city and saying, come play in the, inner, in the NBA with me. This was everything. Now, with that in mind, let's read the story in Scripture that we're talking about and see if maybe we can gather some stuff from this. All right, Matthew chapter 4. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew throwing a net into the water for they fished for a living. What do we immediately know about Peter and Andrew? They weren't the best of the best. We know this because they're working. They're not being a rabbi. That means along the way, someone had told them, you don't have what it takes. You're not good enough. You can't do what I do. Jesus called out to them, come follow me. I will show you how to fish for people. Now, their response has always bothered me. i got to be honest with you. And they left their, nut, their nets at once and followed him. I've read that scripture hundreds of times. I mean, I was born in the church. I'm the kid that was like in church before I was born, right? So, I mean, I've read this a hundred times. And before I learned what I'm teaching you, I would read that and go, well, why? Why did they leave? Why did they walk away from everything? And if you watch B-grade Christian movies, they would have you to believe that maybe it was because Jesus had this halo over him or Jesus could moonwalk or there was just some reason he did it. Well, that wasn't it at all. They've been told by other people that they're not the best of the best, that they can't do it. And now this rabbi has come and told them, you can do it. You can do what I do. Well, of course you would drop everything and follow him. Of course you would run. Of course you would leave everything to follow him because this guy has shown some confidence in you. A little further up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. 
and he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Of course they did. The rabbi said they could do it. Now, I have a very bizarre sense of humor. And you know what I think of when I read this verse? I wonder what, how obnoxious Zebedee had to be the next day at work. That he's getting there to get on his boat, and all the boats are lined up along the shore, and he's kind of strutting down, and, and nobody's saying anything to him. And he finally, you might notice that my sons are not with me. Well, let me tell you why. A rabbi said that. And so suddenly he's the great guy, right? And you know he's just, it's a good thing they didn't have cameras then because you know he would have taken pictures of everybody, you know, and wanted to say, these are my boys that are going to become rabbis. But that's the power of I believe in you. That's the power. That's what can happen to a young guy. But you know what? It's not just guys who need this. We all do. We all need somebody saying, I believe in you. We all need that. Some people would go, okay, B, now this is just kind of psychobabble. I mean, this is America. Aren't we supposed to just pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps? We're just supposed to take care of ourselves? We're not supposed to need this kind of stuff? No, that's not it at all. God made all of us to live in community. We were made to feed off of each other. Hopefully, multi-generational community where one generation looks at a, a couple of generations behind them and says, okay, this is how you do this. Or maybe it's one generation looking at somebody a couple of generations ahead of them going, teach me. Show me how to do this. Help me figure this out. And it's not happening anymore. Sadly, there's an entire generation that's, that's coming up that's lost this. The millennials. If you go home and Google that, it's uh, about 18 to about age 30-ish, something like that. And if you go home and, and Google millennial, you're going to swear to yourself that they're just selfie-taking, Netflix binge-watching, just losers and whiners because they don't want to do anything. But the problem is nobody's helped them. I mean, between skyrocketing divorce rates between two parents that are working 60 hours a week and between helicopter parents who have never taught them anything and never let them suffer any discomfort in the world, they find themselves in their 20s in this stage, in this process of this stage that now has a new word. And it's called emerging adolescence. And it's that people in their 20s are not doing the things that a lot of us did when we were in our 20s to kind of mark adulthood. And, you know, they got some stuff going on. Here's a couple of, of stats. One in seven of those ages 16 to 24 are not in school or don't have a job. One in seven. Thirty-six percent of those ages 18 to 31 are still living with their parents. So, yeah, they got some issues. But you know the reason? You know who's to blame for their issues? Me. If my 24-year-old and 18-year-old are not prepared to take on the world, you know whose fault it is? Mine. It's not theirs. I didn't teach them. And so this entire generation we've got that's struggling so much, the problem is nobody's taught them. Well, hopefully I don't have to convince you that there's a problem. So let's sort of jump through and see if we can find a solution to this. And the solution is really simple because like most solutions, the Scripture teaches us how to fix this problem. Here's some verses from Titus. Guide older men into lives of temperance, dignity, and wisdom, into healthy faith, love, and endurance. Guide older women into lives of reverence so they end up as neither gossips nor drunks but models of goodness. By looking at them, the younger women will know how to love their husbands and children, be virtuous and pure, keep a good house, be good wives. Also, guide the younger men to live disciplined lives. It's how it's designed to be. You can call it mentoring, you can call it coaching, whatever you want to. It's all about helping someone behind us get to where we want them to be. Now, I do this teaching fairly often, and I always get the same pushback. And that is, when, when I'm talking to someone about coaching someone behind them, they always give me the same excuse. I don't have anything to teach them about. I don't know anything. 
Well, sadly for you, I'm about to take that excuse away from you. Because you do have something to speak to us about today. Your mistakes. You know, some people say that the wisest way to learn is from experience. And that's actually not true. The wisest way to learn is from the experience of others. And so you've got this experience. But I'm going to make it even easier for you. I'm going to give you three areas that if you can just teach somebody a couple of generations behind you, every mistake you've ever made and everything you know about these three areas, show them that you believe in them. You're going to be amazed at what can happen. And so here's the first one. Help them develop a moral code to guide their life. Help them develop a moral code to guide their life. Now, hopefully because you're sitting in this room, your moral code is based on scriptures and on the teachings of Jesus. That's what mine is based on. But whatever yours is based on, you had to come up with that. You can't take your parents or somebody else's moral code and then adopt it on as your own because it won't sink in. It won't be strong. You've got to develop that. And so we've got to help people develop a moral code because a moral code is determined um, who they're going to marry. It determines what kind of father or mother they're going to be. It determines how honest they're going to be. It determines how generous they're going to be. It determines how honest they're going to be if they're filling out their expense report. It determines how honest they're going to be when they're filling out their taxes. It even determines who they're going to vote for. And so you spend some time helping somebody a couple of generations behind you determining and coming up with a moral code to guide their life. And then once they've got that, then you help them develop a work ethic to build their life. Did you know building a life is hard? Okay, it's not hard for you. It's hard for me. You've got to help them learn a work ethic. I have a web page, thelauderdale.com, that i got all kinds of stuff like this written on. And I get comments back about this a lot. Um, I also speak to football teams and just everywhere. And I get more questions probably about this than anything that I speak and teach on. I also told you I'm a business manager for a company in town, so that means I read a lot of resumes. Um, I was executive pastor for a while, so I've been hiring people and looking at resumes for a long time. This is probably the area that if we can help them with will make the biggest difference. And it's simple stuff that you can teach them. How to write a resume. How to interview. Um, how to find a job. How to work a job you hate. Why they got fired. Because the reason they're going to come to you and say, oh, I can't believe I got fired. The boss is so mean to me. And you ask a couple of questions and you discover they were late ten times in a month. And they don't understand why that was a problem. They don't understand why the boss got upset and why he got fired or why they can't wear flip-flops or whatever. But just teach them that work ethic to show up on time, to do good work. Teach them the sheer pride of doing a good job for no other reason than the satisfaction it will give them. Teach them a work ethic. And so teach them a, how to develop a moral code to guide their life, a work ethic to build their life, and then finally, teach them common sense to live their life. And when I say common sense, I mean common sense. Stuff that what I'm about to tell you, you will look at me like I'm crazy and go, D, there's no way nobody knows this. But let me tell you, it is. There are people who don't know this. You're just looking back on it like I am after, you know, 30 or 40 years of mistakes, or in my case, having parents who were um, kind enough to teach me this stuff. But teaching them stuff like, do not write a check or use a debit card if you don't have any money in your checking account. I got one going to college, and you ought to hear the stories I've heard from other parents about kids who were using their debit cards and ran up $150 worth of insufficient fund fees. The parent went and asked him, what were you doing? And he thought, the child thought, true story, the child thought, well, I thought this was key to your checking account, not mine. No fun. We have to have a talk now. Teach them how to buy a house. How not to buy the biggest house in the neighborhood because it's the hardest to sell. Teach them how to not go into significant credit card debt. Teach them all of these things that you and I take for granted. Teach them how to do, um, especially if you're getting married. This is real fresh to me because my 24-year-old's getting married in a couple of months. 
teach them how to deal with relatives that they have to be around at Thanksgiving and Christmas that they don't like. Just teaching them these common sense things that we take for granted. But yeah, it sounds silly sounding and it's very simplistic, but you know what? Because it is. It is simple. We just got to help them. We just got to teach them how to do it. Is that something that you could take an hour a week for six months with a couple of people and teach? Teach them everything you know about it and teach them every mistake you've made about it. And if it is, boom, you can blow them away. You can do that. And you can say those words to them, I believe in you. You can express that in them. Now, here's the good part about this. A lot of people don't want to do this because they think they'll mess it up. Let me tell you a little secret. You can't fail. You can't fail at this. And the reason you can't fail at this is because you're not responsible for what they do with it. The same way I'm not responsible for what you do with what I'm teaching you, I'm just responsible for teaching you. And that's the same thing it is with being a mentor. But here's the great thing. The story I told you earlier about Jimmy Harris and the impact that made on me, Jimmy's been dead for over 10 years. I'm I'm almost 50 years old. I've been telling that story for 30 years. That's the legacy that Jimmy left. And wouldn't that be the legacy that all of us would like to leave? That some point, 10 years after we're gone, that somebody is teaching someone else, they're passing on what we taught them. Isn't that the legacy we'd all like to leave? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you care about us deeply enough to teach us these simple things, to teach us these basic things to living, to being successful and effective. And so, God, I pray for those that are out here that are maybe just under a bit of conviction that they need to start sharing what they know. God, I pray that you just put a couple of names in their heart of people that they could have those conversations with. And I also pray for those that need this information, that they would be bold enough and brave enough to go up to someone who is uh, getting it done in their eyes and just ask them, hey, would you spend some time with me? Would you teach me? Would you help me? And God, thank you that you designed this beautiful thing of community so that we could uh, see each other be successful and do the things that you've called us to do. God, thank you for your time. Thank you for your word. And we pray it's in Jesus' name.